We are happy everybody's here today. My name's Teresa James, and I am the city attorney, but also the acting ADA coordinator for the city of San Angelo. Um, I'm going to sit while I do my portion of the presentation because I tend to stroll around when I talk and I leave the mic and then nobody can hear me so I figure it's more important for you to hear me than see me so I'm going to be seated. If anybody would like me to stand up I can make a valiant attempt to stay by that mic but I'm telling you it's probably going to fail. Um, we wanted to do this town hall today. Back in 2018 I started asking questions about asking where our transition plan was that was completed back in the 90s. Um, and when we realized, we found the transition plan, we realized it probably could use a little bit of updating, so we decided to start this process of self-evaluation for the ADA once again. In the meantime, we've had people from the community come to us who asked us to also look at these issues, so it's been kind of an ongoing process, but we're really, now post-COVID, able to spend some time working on these things. Um, I said I'm the city attorney and acting ADA coordinator. I've been doing um, the mandatory training for the ADA coordinator um, certificate, and one thing that people repeatedly say is that um, if you're here, then you must be the person who missed the meeting and got designated the ADA coordinator. And I know they intend that to be a joke, but I find it to be a little bit offensive. And part of that is based on my own personal history and education. Um, I'm the city attorney here, and I've been an attorney for 22 years now. But prior to that, um, I was a special ed teacher for six years. And I worked for the Wisconsin Coalition for Advocacy for at least three years um, and then volunteered most of my career helping people and advocating for people with various kinds of disabilities, particularly kids in school settings. So this kind of work has been part of my history. Throughout my history, it's something that I've always had a heart for. And just being a um, public servant and wanting to work for a city, I just felt like it was very natural for me to volunteer to take on this role um, as somebody who has some understanding. We also have here today um, Daniel Valenzuela, who's our city manager. <clears throat> we have a couple of council members. We have the mayor right there, Brenda Gunter, and we have Larry Miller, who's sitting back there. I don't know if there's any other council members here. I can't see anymore. But if you are, stand up. Nope. We also have Carl White, who is our director of Parks and Recreation. And then down there on the end is Brian Groves, our communications director. And the purpose of this meeting, we want to give you a little bit of information about the kinds of things we're doing, the kinds of services we have provided for a long time to make sure everybody understands um, what is available to them. But also, the most important thing is we want to get your input on how we can make parks and recreation programs more accessible to all our citizens. <clears throat> I know that there might be questions or comments about other aspects of the city. We're planning on having other forums like this to address those other areas of the city government and the other pro the programs and services we provide. But Parks and Rec is pretty big and it's pretty all encompassing and it's one area where a lot of citizens interact with the city directly. So we wanted to start here with its very own session. Um, it's been the history of the city since the 90s, as it has with most public entities, that as projects are developed, they are inspected to ensure that they meet accessibility standards. We might meet the Texas accessibility standards. We have our projects inspected um, by the state and by those inspectors to make sure they're meeting those TOS standards. Um, some of the examples of bigger projects we've had in probably the past 10 to 15 years um, that we've brought up to some sort of standard is the auditorium renovation. Now that building you all know is a historic building. It was not built with any idea that it would be accessible and a lot of work was done to make that facility accessible. Um, all the parks renovations we've done recently, we make sure that those are brought up to the current ADA standard. And then the Chadburn Street renovation downtown, if you'll go downtown you'll notice that there are a lot of um, new facilities for people to make those facilities more accessible as well. Um, we have renewed and expanded our interpreting services contract. I know there was a question to me about, do you know when this contract expires? Is it being renewed? You know, the city has how many employees? Uh, we have 962 right now. 962 employees. And I do not know what every one of them is doing, neither does Daniel or the mayor or, or Mr. Miller at the back. So um, we are able to identify those services and lead you to the right person. But when we came to that contract, it was already being discussed to be expanded or, or renewed, and then we requested it to be expanded to cover all city services and not just municipal court, which is what historically that contract had been used for. 
Um, we've also updated our accessibility information on the city website to make it easier to find. Um, you can look at cosatx.us backslash ADA, and there's these handouts at the back that has a lot of this contact information on it if you'd like to get that. And that has the information about our grievance procedures, how to make requests for accommodations, how to make requests to change policies, all of those things that are going to be hopefully helpful for, to you. You're also welcome to call me and email me as well. And that information, again, I'll have later in the presentation as well on the back table. Um, we have added closed captions to SATV Optimum Channel 17. I think we spent, what, $60,000 on that project recently. And that is a system that learns, and it's a system that we can teach. So after the meetings, you know, initially it probably did have more errors, but after meetings, Brian goes in there and it teaches it certain words that we use commonly. We were kind of laughing that tiers, which is tax increment reinvestment, reinvestment zone, um, is an acronym we use, and it always comes across on the captioning as tears like you're crying. And we figure the first time that that's going to actually spell tears out properly is when somebody's actually mentioning crying because we're trying to teach it to use that tears word, but it's not been successful. But that is a system that is learning and growing, and it should become more and more accurate as time goes on. Um, it's been a while that I've been talking about website accessibility. I mean, a lot of you in the room probably know this is a hotbed of litigation, making websites accessible for citizens. Um, we did an accessibility check on ours, and it started out at 71 percent. Um, working Brian and Lorelei, working very diligently over a couple of weeks, managed to bring that accessibility score up to 85 percent, which means that when you're looking at our website, 85 percent of the information on there should be accessible to be read with some sort of reader. Um, Daniel has also approved a contract with a service provider that's going to further improve and maintain that website for us. It's going to do a weekly check. It checks for things like broken links. It also checks for things like personal information on the website um, so that it can be removed because we certainly want to protect your privacy that way. But it also helps us check for accessibility issues so we can maintain the work that's been done and improve on our website. We have begun training staff on etiquette and responsibilities when assisting all our citizens. You know, I think sometimes people mean to be helpful and they're really just offensive and they don't realize it. I know recently I injured my knee and I was on crutches and everybody wanted to open the door for me, which I understand was coming from a good place for, from them, but for me who was already feeling like I can't do anything for myself, that just made me feel more infirmed. And so really asking the question, can I assist you, would have been more helpful than just opening doors. But that kind of etiquette, um, how we deal with people with service animals, what you do or don't do with the service animal, the questions you ask, all of those kind of things are being discussed with our employees. So hopefully we can provide a better customer experience um, for all of our citizens. Um, we are working to ensure we have hearing assisted devices available in both the council chambers as well as our east mezzanine when we have public meetings. Um, Carl, I don't know if you mind, but Carl uses one of these devices. He probably has it in his pocket right now, and he's very happy with how it works. Um, maybe Brian can talk. You, he can hear, yes. He, you don't see him doing this anymore, so that's a great thing. Um, there's also some new things that might be coming that will make that even more accessible. And we're evaluating city policies for changes and updates. Um, and if you see anything, I mean, we really are encouraging people to fill out the forms or the request for modifications or to point out through our grievance form or just emailing me or calling me anything that you're seeing that is an accessibility issue. Um, because we're just not, we're doing the best we can, but we realize we probably are missing some things. So one of the projects that's upcoming that I think we're all very excited about for a lot of reasons, is upgrading this council chamber. Um, not only to make it more accessible, but just quite frankly to make it function better. The timer doesn't work. I mean, there's mics that don't work. It re really needs updating, but Brian can tell you some of the ADA-related updates we're doing. I'm Brian Groves. I'm the communications director for the city. We handle the, the website, uh, Optimum Channel 17, uh, social media, uh, and this is one of our rooms. We have this room and the, the East Mezzanine at City Hall, and so we take care of all of the uh, technology needs in here. So this room uh, was last updated around 2015 and uh, in a technology standpoint that's that's quite a bit old and so we're having uh, some things in here fail. We're having some microphone issues where the timer is having some issues so it's time for us to to update those things. And uh, one of the things that we're doing we mentioned assisted uh, assistive listening devices. Uh, we only have a couple of those. We're going to get 
a few more of those, but they're also going to um, have the ability to integrate with your cell phone. And so that will be able, people won't have to necessarily have the, the device that Carl has. You'll be able to use your cell phone, I believe, and, and be able to make that easier on you. Uh, the other thing uh, that we are talking about is the ASL interpreter, uh, like a picture-in-picture -picture and a broadcast. Uh, currently, we have a picture-in-picture -picture capability, but the system is so old, anytime you uh, try to use that, the system crashes. And so it was not designed, this specific build was not designed for ASL. That is one thing that we are going to, to have in our new build is that we will have a dedicated um, screen if we need ASL for council or for a town hall. We'll have that ability to do that um, and have either someone on screen or someone here. Uh, and that, that box will be specifically, specifically designed for it, whereas the one now is, is just a picture-in-picture picture and you can't move it around or anything like that. Uh, the other thing we're doing, we mentioned closed captioning. Uh, we have closed captioning on SATV channel 17. Um, that is different and independent from the captions you would see on YouTube right now. Um, and so uh, we, we do get some feedback that one of those is not good. And, and so I can tell you that they're independent right now, but that, that will hopefully change with this project. The vendor that we're going to use is going to take the, the caption signal from our, our channel and push that with our live stream to whatever social media platform, which we use YouTube. And that should improve the captions for that. The other thing we're looking at doing is adding two screens. So like these two back here, we would add two screens below those, like one and one and it would send live captions in the room so people could read the captions on the TV. And so those are some of the, the things that we're looking at in the room, so. Thank you. Um, Daniel, did you have anything to say before we have Carl get up here? No, actually, the only thing I have to say is, uh, first of all, we have a very capable, I just want to make sure that I stress that, we have a very capable interim ADA director in Teresa, as you heard, as far as her experience. Uh, she's, she's wonderful. Uh, not only is she uh, just a great attorney for the city, she's very thoughtful and cares a lot about people. And I can tell you that she'd be a strong advocate for doing anything that's required through ADA as far as accessibility. Uh, so I'm very confident that she's going to do a, a fine job. I know that uh, right now she's stepping in in a role that, quite frankly, uh, when I discussed this with her, uh, just her experience alone uh, told me that she uh, definitely could do just a wonderful job right now in the interim. Uh, you'll also find that we have ca staff, uh, directors, uh, that are fully capable as well. They're here to learn from you. Uh, if there's anything, again, on your end uh, that you want to share with us that you know that we can improve upon, we are here to dedicate ourselves to make that happen. So, again, uh, we look forward to hearing from you, and thank you. Now we have the star of the show. We really, I mean, people can comment on whatever you'd like, but we really want to try to focus this particular meeting on parks and recreation programs and services. We do plan on having other, as I said, meetings to discuss other aspects of city's projects and um, services and programs that we have. Um, so we have Carl here, but I think he also has a number of people from his staff here as well, and I'll let him introduce those folks. Yes, yeah, so let me mention them right quick. And when we get to the point where we're asking questions and answering, and getting the input, uh, they may be able to come forward and, and answer some of your questions. But first of all, Roger Havlock, the parks manager senior, he's sitting in the back. Brent Casey with recreation. Sid Walker from Civic Events. He did a presentation earlier today on the river stage. Some of y'all heard that. Uh, Mario De La O, also with parks. Jeremy Walker with Fairmount Cemetery. And Bob Bluehart will be here from Fort Concho. He's finishing up his board meeting. Did I get everybody? Okay. Thank you. So, yes, when we do every project, and most of our projects, if we have the money, we do contract those projects out. But also when we do them in-house, as you know, the, the three key things that we, we have to meet, the standards that we have to meet, we have to provide accessible parking, we have to provide an accessible route from the parking to the facility. And you, once you get to the facility, you should be able to use the facility, whether it's a playground or if it's a convention center. Starting with uh, recreation, the Santa Fe Crossing Senior Center is in two buildings, Santa Fe Crossing Building, which was renovated in the late 90s, and Station 618, which was renovated in the early 2000s. Both of those are accessible. 
Uh, we provide different exercise classes, fitness classes, different programs, crafts, and games, and the Keystone activity, which is the congregate meal program. And some of these are just examples, but we also provide gardens, and these gardens particularly have a way to access them. Uh, there's ac accessible routes to and through them. The visitor center, Civic League Park, which is the water lily collection, gazebo garden across the street, and the tiered gardens between the art museum and the municipal pool. We have adaptive recreation programs, and I've recently heard that that term may not be an acceptable term, so if you have input on, the, on what we should call the programs, we do want to hear from you. But we've provided recently volleyball, and more recently basketball, upcoming baseball, as well as soccer uh, programs. Municipal pool was renovated, I think, 2011, I believe. It does have a zero depth entry and also a pool lift on the deeper end. Uh, we provide their movie nights and splash party, and we also do private rentals. Fishing, uh, I'll go start with the bottom first. We have a fishing platform at Kirby Park. You can park at the parking lot. This is an accessible route to, to the fishing platform, and that's on the North Concho River. Kirby Park's off of Edmond Boulevard on the north side of the city. Recently, uh, the, there's a new fishing pier at Lake Nasworthy. There's not currently an accessible route to it, uh, but I saw the plans for doing that last Friday. Uh, our engineering folks and the operations folks have work, are working on a plan to pave the Caliche parking lot and provide an accessible route to that pier. Playgrounds, and these are just a few examples <clears throat> that we uh, ensure accessibility to the playgrounds. Glenmore Park off Paint Rock Road, Kirby Park, Unidad Park, which is our our uh, standard bearer for uh, accessible playgrounds. That playground was done in the late 90s, and we recently redid it, and we, we ensured that it met the same standard that the playground once had. And there, primarily, we have the poured in place fall zone material, uh, which um, is the best thing you can provide as far as accessibility to playgrounds, uh, but it is very expensive. There, it, you can access all directions at the playground and access all equipment. Producers Park also has an accessible playground, Padrone Park, even uh, the playground at Rio Concho Community Park and uh, City Park. Accessible trails, uh, <clears throat> a small correction, Bell Street to First Street, there is an accessible route. There, it's mostly accessible, it's recently redone from Bell Street to about um, the retirement home. The section from there to Concho Avenue does need to be improved, but we also have to do some bank stabilization along that way first, and then we'll, re we'll redo the walkway. Uh, the section from Concho Avenue to First Avenue, uh, First Street was recently redone in, when we redid the river project in 2013. The Red Arroyo Trails is a good standard bearer for an accessible trail. We do have to maintain that trail to ensure that after big rains, the mud that gets on the trail, we have to make sure we take that off. Recently, staff in-house has redone the, the, the trail at Brown Park, Brown Neighborhood Park. Uh, also, Unidad Park, Padrone Park, Producers Park, and Kirby Park all have accessible trails. When we do our park renovations, we always make sure that we do have uh, accessible picnic areas. And, um, and usually that includes one or two accessible picnic tables at the pavilions and one or two in the outlying picnic areas underneath trees. And these accessible tables, we do either two different ones. One has accessible uh, for wheelchair place within the table itself on the side, and then some have it on the end. So you have different options. And we do inspections at all levels from uh, the groundskeeper all the way up to the director. We do inspections on a, a regular and frequent basis from daily to uh, monthly inspections.
on all of our parks and playgrounds, and we also look for accessibility issues. Uh, this was presented today at City Council, uh, improvements to the river stage to improve accessibility. We know we have issues there, and we do want to hear from you on those, and we have heard uh, a lot of the concerns already, and that's we've incorporated those into those improvements. Uh, but we want to create uh, accessible walkways within the fenced area. Uh, currently, there's an accessible walkway, but it's outside of the fence, which it, it needs to be within the side of the, inside the fence. Uh, improve accessibility to the stage and within the stage building itself. And uh, improving accessibility within the dressing room bathrooms at the River Stage building. Also improving the, the bathrooms in terms of accessibility, uh, updating our signage, uh, and bringing up all the restrooms to accessible standards. It includes the, uh, the toilets, the partitions, the counter heights, and then the routes to the box office and to the concessions. So, and I, I go to concerts a lot, so I know uh, about accessibility at concerts. And so I, I understand uh, what folks need to get to the box office, office to the performance area to be able to view. And I do want to add that there's one other thing that we're looking at at the River Stage that wasn't listed on that list. Um, I think it was Kim that sent us a article regarding um, viewing areas at these kind of venues, and Al, who's at the back. Um, wearing the mask, and so we're not going to make him talk too much if he doesn't have to, but he did decide to come here in case there are questions. I mean, he looked at those suggestions, and he's planning some, I think it's elevated seating, so that people who are in a wheelchair don't have to sit there and look at a bunch of bottoms when everybody else is standing up. So we're looking to see if there's ways that we can make better viewing platforms for people to make that, that kind of service more accessible as well. Um, so now it's your turn to talk to us. And we have a mic, and I'm going to bring it around, and I'm going to try to remember to let the interpreter speak when they need to speak. And I will bring it around to you. My, he's going to turn this on because I'm going to forget to do that. But um, these are the kind of things we're really interested in getting your input on. If there's other things you want to add, we're, of course, willing to listen to that as well. Um, but, but we're really interested in physical barriers that you encounter that we maybe haven't discussed or haven't thought of. Any kind of operational barriers you encounter, whether that's a policy or that is the way that we manage people or that's the way we manage seating. I know that's been raised to us. Any kind of those barriers that we might be able to adapt or adjust, we're interested in hearing your input on that. Um, any modifications we can make to improve accessibility? As I said, we look at that every time we do a new project anyway, but if there's anything that we can do in the interim, um, to improve accessibility to our things, we're of course willing to consider that. And then any ideas you may have for new programs or services that we don't already have, that would also be welcomed. Um, for anybody who's watching online, we do have um, two ways that you can comment and any comments that are appropriate and on topic, we will just, we'll read out loud here. Um, though you can send those to info at cosatx.us or you can just put the comment in the comments area on the video that you're watching and we will make a record of those as well. So, a few more things. Again, the pages at the back is basically this screen. It's how you address uh, questions, concerns, or requests. It has our website that Brian's done a good job of shortening to make it easy to find. You can also just type ADA into the search box on our website and it brings you to this accommodations page. On that page you can make, there's our grievance procedure, there's requests for modifications to policies, you can make an accommodation request. There's a copy of our current transition plan and our self-assessment will be updated there as we complete it. Um, the transition plan is, as I said, from the 90s, so expect it to look like it was from the 90s. It was on a typewriter. Um, and then if you're not comfortable using the internet or you just prefer not to, you're always welcome to call my office. The number's right there, 325-657-4407. You probably talk to Sarah or Dahlia and they're both fantastic and very helpful. Um, or you can email me directly at teresa.james at cosatx.us. And last but not least, 
we are creating, I know there's a little confusion about this, we are creating a committee, an ADA advisory committee, that's the mayor's committee on accessibility. Um, it's not going to be a committee that is codified in our code of ordinances. We are actually looking at whether or not all of those kinds of boards are necessary right now, but we are interested in gathering people to help us with some of these things. I know Abilene has a group of citizens that when they are going through a facility to look for changes, this committee of their citizens goes with them and they point out things that maybe we as a person who doesn't have a disability would not identify. So there's two ways you can let us know if you're interested in that. The first is you can call my office and just tell Sarah Dahlia that you're interested in being on this committee and they'll take your contact information. Um, you can also email me at teresa.james at cosatx.us. All right, so now it's your turn. We'll bring it to you. Uh, okay, I'm just gonna stand over here. Okay, can I stand right here? Is that okay? It's okay. okay. All right. Um, hello, my name is Kim Henry, and I spoke at City Council this morning. Um, and I'm also the chair for the San Angelo Advocacy for Access, which was started because there was a lack of accessibility and compliance within San Angelo um, last fall. So a couple things that I want to point a point out is. Um, one, please make sure you allow longer time for people that need it for accommodations. Um, but a couple things. <laughs> One, the transition plan. Nowhere in the city's agenda since 2018 has it talked about the transition plan. So I don't know where it's been reviewed. Um, the accessibility check that the city's referring to was actually um, an accessibility check that was provided by Disability Connections that they thanked us for. Um, otherwise, we had heard of no other accessibility check on the website. The grievance procedures, accommodation requests, and other documents were also provided by the San Angelo Advocacy for Access, so I think it's important um, if you want to participate, this is why, is because we're providing the city with a lot of materials to use. When I talked to Brian Kendrick, who at the time was the ADA coordinator, uh, or designated human resource director, um, back in last summer, he had never even heard of an ADA coordinator, and he didn't even know that the transition plan was completed in 1993. So I really don't know where we're getting the fact that we've been working on this since 2018. It's very upsetting. Um, to me, another thing is the ADA training. Also came from San Angelo Advocacy for Access. We requested that the city staff participate in training, and we were, had no updates that anybody had done that. And there's no confusion on the committee, um, because in February 21st, I believe, we had a meeting with the city staff, and we were told that there is not gonna be a committee because they don't know what the expectations are, even though we also provided that to them as well. Um, and I found out, thanks to Larry, um, that St. Angelo actually used to have a marriage committee on persons with disabilities, so they do have all they need. So we provided that information because that's the last update we were provided. Um, I believe that if, you, if the city is proud of where you stand with accessibility, then I recommend making a brochure or a booklet um, or some form of media of all the accessible activities in parks with labels and maps. Um, and a recommendation that I have is the same way essentially that we celebrate downtown or anything else in San Angelo, we should celebrate accessibility. I want to, um, on a couple things on the river stage, clarify where the restrooms will be. It was a little confusing on the map. And what's the plan for accessible viewing? So to let everyone know, what I provided was options to allow for accessible seating at events, which is either a temporary or permanent lifted stage or an area that's designated. Obviously, if you're using a wheelchair, you can't see over everybody sitting or standing in front of you. Um, so we're really hoping that they implement that. Um, I also want to make a comment from Ashley Moheski, who could not be here tonight. She's not feeling well. Um, she said, don't just stick a ramp somewhere or pave a sidewalk and call it accessible. Actually think about the potential dangers of how it's built or paved, such as a steep ramp on Chadburn that was just completed or a, the place that a ramp is located. You can park in an accessible parking area, but the ramp to the sidewalk is at the opposite side or something like that. Accessible, accessible doesn't always mean accessibility doesn't always mean accessible just because a ramp is in place or there's an accessible door button. Actually make things align to what people need. Um, so as we... Um, as we look at the river stage and everything else, I'm, I want the public to take time. I feel like there's already been a lot of time taken, so I want to make sure everyone here is encouraged and empowered to speak up about what you feel your needs are, and I really appreciate you being here. If you don't feel comfortable, which I've been told a lot, that people still aren't comfortable with responding to the city um, or filing a grievance on the city, you can still contact me. Um, my information will be on the table in the back. Um, 
And the last thing is I'm leaving early because it's my son's first t-ball game, so please don't take me leaving as me being upset or running out. Um, I'm not going to miss my four-year-old's first t-ball game. Uh, the last thing that I'll say for the river stage that I didn't notice is that there's nothing that talked about the technology. Um, the same technology that we're needing for here is literally the same technology for all city services programs and facilities, and that includes the river stage. So there needs to be an in-screen, um, picture-in-picture. There needs to be AS, a stand for the ASL interpreter. There needs to be a screen that provides that. Um, all of these things need to be considered. So the technology piece that we're going to possibly talk about tonight um, also needs to be developed in everything that the city has, because they don't have it anywhere, not just city council. Um, I think, I'm sorry. Oh, another thing is the, the, with the river stage is the lighting and the handrails. Um, actually, in Andre and I's first presentation, we mentioned the river stage and how I had to watch five grown men help one man walk down the stairs because there's no lighting. There's no, um, the stairs are rocks. There's no railing. It's extremely dangerous. So we need to make sure that's updated as well. Um, and I want to uh, turn over the mic to Mr. Larry. Um, I'm, of course, humbled by the people that are here, and I believe everyone deserves an introduction. However, I wanted to introduce a new friend uh, specifically because considering what we're doing today, it's almost deja vu for him. Um, he's been a disability rights champion in San Angelo for a long time and is a vital asset. Um, Larry retired from the United States Postal Service last August for 37 years. And he also served on the governing board for Texas School for Deaf from 1995 to 2004. And I wanna share some of his awards with you. Um, not that his awards justify his presence and thoughts here today, but I wanted to share some. The Certificate of Congressional Recognition, the 2004 National Diversity Achievement Award, Exemplary Service to Lone Star State awarded by Governor Rick Perry, Special Accommodation by Texas Association of School Boards, Grassroots Leadership Award, U.S. Postal Service Special Achievement Award, Disabled Person of the Year in Texas by Governor Ann Richards, Certificate of Accommodation from San Angelo for Saving a Man's Life, and also Disabled Person of the Year from San Angelo. Um, so again, I wanna turn it over and provide the microphone to Larry after she has something to say. Thank you, Kim. Um, just to be clear, this is not like a council meeting where there's a limit on your comments. We would ask that you be respectful of others because we want to give as many people the opportunity to speak, but there is no time limit. So take the time that you need to communicate. I do have some maps here of the renovation at the River Stage. Um, if you want to take these and take a look at them so that you can see a little closer and take it home and study it. As I said, we are accepting comments um, at that info. Um, at cosatx.us website. If you could just put ADA comment in the subject line, that'll help us distinguish those from other comments we get. But we are definitely looking for um, some input onto this river stage. It's something that council directed this morning that we do. Um, the reason we took it to council before coming here is because if they weren't going to tell us, go ahead and renovate the river stage, there's no reason to ask you guys what kind of renovation should we do. So that was the reason for that order. But we are looking for your input. Um, Al, correct me if I'm wrong. We are doing in, in some lighting and those sorts of renovations as well, correct? correct? Yes. So all of those things are being considered by our staff. Okay. Who? Well, hello everyone. So I'm I'm happy to be here tonight to support the the ADA. I think that's very important for me, especially. It's been very important. And I was the um, president of the mayor's committee for people with disabilities. And I served I served on that for many years. And I retired from the post office, like she said, um, after 37 years. So that was that was just last year. So. Yeah, but it's interesting for me to see all of the uh, renovations that are happening. I do support um, all of the renovations that are needed for the handicapped, for the blind, for the deaf, um, everything. And I want to be involved with that. You know, I want everyone to be comfortable with that as well. So I think I think we all have a right to for accessibility and for everything to be um, accessible to us. And I see, um, um, and the certificate that she talked about, I did save a man's life from a fire. 
And that was in 1990. Many people don't, don't even realize that happened. And, and people wouldn't think that because I'm deaf that would, I would be able to do that um, because there was communication barriers. But um, I did. And I know that like the Pops concert at the River Stage, oh, it's so beautiful. I love to see all the fireworks and everything at the River Stage and all of the, um, all of the events that are there. That's really awesome. Um, I think that the accessible seating area is a good idea as well and a good place for the interpreter to stand. I think that's, um, I do want to make sure that that's, that that's noted as well. And uh, one day I would like to work with all of you up here for um, making sure that the city is ADA accessible. So thank you. Well, we do have a committee we're forming. So if you are interested in serving on that, please let us know and we would be happy to have you join us. Right now I have a big project that I'm working on. It's for the National Jamboree which is for the Boy Scouts of America. And that'll be in West Virginia. I think there's a little, many thousands of people that are gonna be there. But my presentation and my project is specifically for deaf and hard of hearing scouts and their parents and, and people that work with them. So um, I'd be happy to, you know, it's, um, I serve on the Boy Scouts committee and so I'd, I'd be happy to serve on that committee as well. We have our first committee member, that is fine. Um, so, Brian, do we have any comments on either the video or through email yet? Oh, yeah. No. Okay. All right. Who else would have a comment they'd like to make? Here, I'll bring it to you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for providing this particular forum. We certainly need it. Thank you. I also want to compliment uh, Mr. Walker. I watched his presentation today and I think he has a real handle on what the River Stage needs as far as vendors, as far as performers, and I think he has done the very best he can do as far as making uh, it accessible. However, there are a few things that I'd like to bring up. The first thing that was mentioned this morning for those of you weren't, that weren't there is a handicapped van. My daughter Leandra danced uh, with Judge Dusick uh, in the Nutcracker. And so Judge Dusick wanted her to go to the River Stage because they were having a big presentation. And she told us how to come in and that she'd be there to help and all. And it going over the bump there took off my, it separated my muffler from the catalytic converter. <clears throat> and it was a pretty costly thing to have to take it in and put it back together just because I followed the directions of how to get to the uh, section where they were having VIP uh, dinner and all of the other things that went with it. The other thing that I would like to mention is this looks wonderful, but until you've been down to the river stage and tried to go down and tried to sit there, my husband, who was a pretty good carpenter when he had to be, that wasn't his calling, but out of necessity, he built a leveler. And so what he would do is he would cart this thing with us and then he would dig it into the side of the hill so that when her wheelchair was there, it sat on level ground instead of her sitting forward. And that's the sort of thing until you've been in a wheelchair and been at that particular place that you don't even realize that that's what happens to you. Another thing is, even though you meet ADA requirements as for a ramp, sometimes that ramp is not accessible because it's not wide enough to actually Christy. For all of you that have ever snow skied, you know that, well, I don't go straight down the mountain, but most people, Christy, back and forth across the, 
the slope. And that's what you have to do if you're by yourself in a wheelchair. So is this particular drawing going to allow for that? Is the slope going to meet requirements, but because of the way that it's designed, not, not fit people? So I'd like to make this uh, re request, I guess. We have some wonderful engineers employed by the city, and then we go outside. And I know that they all know ADA requirements, but sometimes it would be nice if somebody said, well, hey, we're doing this. Let's just call up somebody that's in a wheelchair and say, you see anything wrong with this? so that we don't get into actually making it. I think the what's called the death ramp actually meets ADA requirements. It's just not practical if you're really in a wheelchair. So for that reason, we'd kind of like to say, well, you know, I know that you time is of the essence and maybe you don't want to have people uh, involved in an engineer's business, but it might save a lot of trouble later on if they were allowed to. So I appreciate your having this first meeting, and again, I appreciate you because I could tell you know your business. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Al, do you have anything to add on the ramps? <clears throat> My name is Al Torres. I'm the um, construction manager. I'm, uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm very sick right now. <laughs> um, I'm an architect for the city. And um, in looking at all these projects, the River Stage and all the other projects that I manage, we, we do look at uh, ADA guidelines, uh, including the ramps and the River Stage. That is one of the things we're looking at. The, the River Stage is more than just bringing just handicapped people down from the upper levels is bringing everybody down from the upper levels. So it's going to be a, a, a kind of a grander uh, ramp uh, type of situation and a grander staircase that will bring everybody down. So there should be plenty of room uh, uh, to bring everybody down. So we, we'll keep that in mind when we, when we design it. Uh, I don't remember right now that those are just the very preliminary drawings, uh, preliminary stages. We'll have to get a, a, an AE team on board to, to get the actual specifics. But I, I would imagine it would be at least 10 or 15, 10 or 15 feet away, right? Yeah. Okay. No offense, Al, but we're going to clean this mic. Okay, do we have any other questions, particularly about the river stages, if you have them, so we can let Al go home? Okay, we'll do this one right here first. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to ask a clarifying question. I was curious, so for wheelchair access the accessibility, I, I, I'm not familiar with it, so I just want to make sure I know. But for the river stage, um, Do they have a, a special place for, um, like, if you know, if there's if there's inclement weather or something happens while someone who's handicapped and using a wheelchair is in the river, like it's in that main part of the river stage, is there an accessible exit that they can use, like an emergency exit for those in wheelchairs? Al shaking his head, no. <laughs> okay, get your spray ready, Sid. Mm -hmm. There is currently no area of ref refuge um, for accessible persons, and that's another thing we'll be looking at. Um, accessibility to the river stage itself is one of the biggest problems there. Uh, there are parking lots up above on top of the hill, but there are no parking lots that actually serve the river stage directly. So technically, we are required to make a certain percentage of whatever parking spaces you provide handicap accessible, but if we're not providing handi par par parking lots, and you're not pro required to pro provide any. So one of the things I'm looking at is I'm looking at 
places that maybe I can create some new parking spaces that are handicap accessible, that are close to the to the stage, that are that are on an accessible route. Um, that'll get people there, and then also get people out afterwards um, from an area of refuge. Okay, any other questions or comments about the river stage? Um, I've never been to the river stage, and I've really regretted it because um, I can't walk very far. And so um, my concern is the accessible parking and how far I would actually have to walk and what the ramp incline or decline would be, I guess, because of my foot. And I think that people with, not that I can speak for people, but... Um, everyone but people with walkers might have the same issue I know that some walkers have a seat and so you know they can at least stop and sit down but like I don't have a walker so um that's always been a, a an issue like I didn't get to go to Dia de los Muertos specifically because I know that the um art museum only has like four or five accessible spots and I didn't know how to walk. Like, I didn't know where to walk or how far it would be. It just looks far to me. Also, um, the bathroom situation. So I love the fact that there are plans to put the bathrooms down um, closer to the stage and then on the left, on the, on the... But my other... my If I am able to walk <laughs> to the facility... Um, and I want to sit on the steps. I think we really need rails because um, I could probably walk down the steps if I had a rail to hold on to. It would just be, okay. Um, but I, I know it's in a particularly weird spot. And so, but I'm, I'm hoping that I get to go one day. Do we have anybody else for the river stage? Okay. No more river stage. We're going to let Al go home. Okay. Here you go. Here you go, Nina. Um, I just, I'm sorry. I just wanted to know, outside of today, or I guess you're still developing right now the river stage plans, but outside of today, did you have any discussions or engage any individuals with disabilities in, in planning and designing this? did send our initial plans to Kim who reviewed it our list of accessible elements we were going to have and see if there was anything that she knew of or if she could share that information with somebody else she did provide us that information on the accessible seating which was very helpful and very enlightening for Al so um, this is what we anticipated to be the action that was taken at council today was just saying yeah go ahead and work on the river stage so there's not really been anything set in stone this is the opportunity for people to offer us that input I will add that I've been an architect for about 40 years, and so I've been working with ADA guidelines for, for a long time. I'm very familiar with them. Uh, so anything I design, I will automatically look at uh, getting those in place. Uh, in addition to that, my elderly 80-something-year-old mother-in-law has been living with us for for the last 20 years, and we've been getting her to the River Stage for events. and. I understand the difficulties getting her to uh, places. We we took we took her to New York City. We took her to California. We took her to Disney World, and and there's always challenges in getting getting her you know in different places. So I understand what it takes to get people into in and out of those places, and it's not just people in wheelchairs. It's people with bad knees. My wife has bad knees, and she has trouble with stairs. Uh, so she's done in a wheelchair, but she has a lot of difficulty climbing up and down stairs. So again, the, the the steps at the at the seating will have to provide rails and, and things like that. So I'm I'm, I'm looking I'm going to be looking carefully uh, at all of that. Okay, y'all, be cautious. He doesn't have a spray. Um, I want to add that 
that I heard your comment, and I completely agree that sometimes the standards we build to and actual usefulness is not the same. We are sometimes in the conflict, though, where we have to build to that standard in order for the project to be approved by some grant or somebody. But these kind of sessions are what I hope will provide us some insight into what is actually helpful and what's not. So maybe we can, you know, get more input on those designs as they're coming forward and also to ourselves understand better what is actually good design and what's just meeting a standard. Yes. Would it be possible for, because I know the parking for the river stage is kind of non-existent, would it be possible to do something like, you know, Six Flags does in their parking lot, having um, those long uh, golf carts or, and, you know, kind of carts, not to, um, you know, for the people who can't walk very well, I guess. Um, I think that would be a great addition. Um, I know I would love it and it would be a nice, accessible little extra. Um, the updates that I got, or the questions that I got from the city attorney, um, did ask for ideas for the river stage, and as we stated, or we've told uh, the city before, we're not ADA experts, and we're also not attorneys. Um, so we can provide some ideas of what we've observed and heard, um, but they were very minor. This is my first time today, actually, at city council, was the first time seeing the, the plan. So um, again, if you have any other ideas, if you don't want to forward them to her or anybody else in the city, then please let me know, and I don't mind pushing them forward. If you'd also like to e read the email, please let me know, and I can forward that email to you. Thank you. Anybody else? River stage. Okay, Al, you can go. Enjoy your evening. All right, did you have a comment, Mr. Miller, that you wanted to make? I just wanted to put in a plug for the old people, like Major over here. Uh, this dis doesn't just affect uh, those folks with disabilities. It affects me. It affects a lot of people in this room that we, we need to do this because it's smart to do for every citizen. Yes. I agree. We, we acknowledge that 20% of our population at any given time, maybe even higher here because we have an elderly population, does have some sort of disability that needs to be accommodated, whether that's physical or something else. Um, and really, most of us are probably going to end up there at some point. So as Mr. Miller said, it is beneficial for all of us. And the other misconception out there that I hear sometimes is that people with disabilities want to be treated differently. And my perception on that is they don't want to be treated differently. They want to get the same services that everybody else does. And so I push back on that comment anytime I hear it. It's not appropriate, and I don't think it's accurate. How's everybody doing? My name is Sydney Walker, the Civic Events Manager. I just wanted to let everybody know that if you are trying to purchase tickets, you can purchase them online, and they do have a link to where you can call for ADA, uh, ADA accessible tickets as well. If you do ever have an issue with those outside of the rodeo, I can definitely help you out <laughs> with the issues. Um, I'll, I'll be more than willing to help anyone out for it. And just, just let me know. You can give me a call at three, uh, if y'all have a pen, it would be 325-653-9577. Or you can also email me at sydney.walker at cosatx.us. And if you have any suggestions, 653-9577. Any other questions and concerns, you can also reach out to me. I'm, I'm more than glad to go down to the river stage and walk with you through the river stage. If you need somebody to walk you through the plans and the ideas that we do have, I'm all for it too as well. So just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. all It always sounds like a rock star. <laughs> Did you have a comment? Right here. He, I think he had his hand up real quick. Did you have a comment? Okay. Um, I have. I kind of want to go back to the playground. Um, I'm wondering if there's any way that the city can have security at 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 at, at least one security guard at each playground. The reason I say that is um, a few weeks ago, my sister took her seven-year-old and her five-year-old to the playground um, over by the river, I don't know what, the, over by the Y. Um, and um, there were junior high slash younger high school kids there that were run, running around with knives. And um, they were cussing, they were screaming, you know, terrified my, my sister and my nieces. Um, and so 
they went to another playground, the one over off, it's off of Bryant and 14th, I think. It's that big one over there. I, I don't know. I'm not originally from here, so. Um, and when they got there, there were two different adults, two different, uh, two different fights between adults. Um, what, right after they left from kids running around with knives. And I didn't know if that's something that the city has looked into, if it's, you know, even if you can have a police officer that can sometimes just drive by there. Um, my sister was terrified. She won't take her, she won't take her nieces, I mean her grandchildren to the parks anymore because she said it's, it's too dangerous. And these are nice parks. You know, they're very well set up. They're nice parks. Kids should be able to enjoy them. And they can't do that if you've got people running around with knives. This test. So, yeah, I'm a little sad to hear that because I, I want folks to go to the parks and enjoy the parks and playgrounds. Uh, if folks do see some activity like that with teenagers with knives, they're always welcome to call the police. <clears throat> if we do know we have an issue at a particular location, we can ask the police to do a, a close patrol of that location for a number of time, a week or two weeks. So uh, if folks see an issue, they, they should report it. Brian, any comments online or emails? Okay, good. Who's next over here in the pink? <clears throat> yeah, just piggybacking off of what you had said earlier about people with disabilities being treated the same. Um, my daughter has intellectual disabilities, and so I would like to address, maybe it's Carl, I'm not sure, um, for the Challenger League. So my daughter has participated in the Challenger League for a number of years now, um, both, oh, I'm sorry, uh, both with uh, t-ball, baseball, and also basketball and volleyball. Um, and so, first of all, I feel like it's an underrepresented um, league as far as advertising goes. There's not a lot of advertising that goes into that. Um, I didn't find out about it for quite a few years and I'm um, very involved with Autism Alliance and different things like that in the city. Um, and so I also take a little bit of problem with how that league is handled um, when compared to the other leagues that the city provides. And so um, I'm not the only one bringing this issue for you. I'm also speaking on behalf of other parents that I have um, interacted with throughout the years. Um, a couple of examples of this is whenever uh, the children are supposed to have their practices, the coaches don't show up. Um, and so the kids are just kind of there by themselves. Um, consistently, sometimes the coaches don't show up to the games. And so then the parents are coaching the games. And I may look little, but I don't play sports. I'm not athletic and I don't know the rules of basketball. And so when I'm out there on the court and I'm just trying to you know, direct the kids, I mean, I'm doing the best I can, but I don't understand when we compare that to the other leagues in, this, um, in the same you know, uh, city, how that league looks um, Looks kind of like a, a ragtag uh, league, for lack of a better word, compared to the other ones. I also take a little bit of offense at the name Challenger, and you brought that up earlier, the Challenger League. And so that has a little bit of a negative connotation with that in suggesting that these kids have challenges. And so um, I have kind of thought of a couple of different names. You had asked about that earlier, but um, we have some things like Team Supreme, Rise, Summit, Frontier, Voltage, Dreamers, or even the Adventure League. Anything would be better than the Challenger League. Um, yeah, something that is actually inspiring, right? These kids, like you said, want to be treated like the other ones. So I can't understand why, um, you know, with those coaches. And a lot of times, even when I signed my children up, and it happened this time, I was in your office last week and signed my daughter up for baseball. And when I try to ask, like, when are the games going to be? When are the practices going to be? When, you know, because I'm, I'm paying for these services, and I have three kids, and I have a 
schedule, you know, of a family of five that I'm trying to schedule for. And I always say, I always get told like, well, we don't know, we'll let you know. Um, and I know the manager that's over that and he's very hard to contact and he's very hard to get a response back that's clear. And I'm constantly having to email, I have email chains. And so I just wanted to bring that to attention. I know that's not an accessibility issue, but uh, there's a lot of kids in that league. Um, and there's a lot of issues that we've had over the years. And I feel like us parents, have to put up with them because there's not a lot of services for our kids that have intellectual disabilities. And so it's kind of like we're getting, um, we're taking what we're given, but I would like to see that be a little bit better if we can. I think that's exactly the kind of comment that we're looking for. It doesn't have to be physically accessible, but any of those things that we may not be aware of. Carl, do you or Brent, anybody wanna make a comment? No? <clears throat> Hi, I'm Brent Casey. I'm the recreation manager that is over that league, so I'm not sure if you're referring to me or not, but okay. I, was, I didn't think so because I like to call people that. Okay, so last Friday when I talked to Kim, she said that was the first time that I'd been addressed with the issues of the name. I told her, hey, I'm more than welcome. In a conversation, give us the name that you want us to use. We can change it in a heartbeat, no problem. All of our coaches are volunteers for all of our leagues pretty much, so them not showing up, I'll take a look into that, I promise, and I'll see if I can get more solid coaches. But when you come to register for the things, they don't know when the practice is gonna be because we have to get with the coaches and make sure it fits into their schedule. So once the teams are put together, then we get the coaches, then, then we do that. Um, feel free to call me, just ask for the big ugly guy in the recreation office, whatever you wanna do. But that's me, I'll be happy to talk to you about anything, so please, if there's any issues with anything in recreation, don't hesitate, come come in there, because that Kim's phone call last Friday was the first time I heard of issues. Yeah, and I had talked to her before, and I think that's, I brought that to her, and then she brought that to you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She actually called and talked to one of my staff. He came and briefed me on the conversation. I called her back later that day, so even it was. That, even that explanation, even the explanation that you gave me of, okay, our coaches are volunteers, that's doable. When I go and I ask, and they're like, well, we don't know. they don't explain that to me. So it just looks like, well, we don't know, you know, instead of, yeah, I appreciate that. All right, thank you. We had a question over here and then over here. Is that right? No? Over here? Here you go. I'm Gloria Villarreal with MHMR Services, and I brought one of our individuals that would like to talk about bus, bus services. Hello. Introduce yourself. <clears throat> My name is Mary Sanchez, and... Just front? Okay. <laughs> and I know you still. My name is Mary Sanchez, and I want to see if the, the bus can put uh, like a bus stop to our, I live in Riverside's apartment, and, and, and then I'm, I live in Riverside apartment, and then we have to walk all the way to River Point, and there's this old man, he's been around the 70s. In until it was kind of a, a slow, I mean, real slow man to walk where you are to that corner. We'll see if we can have a, a, a bus stop in that corner by the river place, I mean, river site apartment. If it's, if, it's, uh, if it's okay with you. Thank you. Daniel, did you, you look like you want to say something? No? No? Yeah. Yeah, we don't actually run the transit system, but we do know those who do, and we can certainly pass that on. I know we coordinate with them a lot on bus stops and where they're located. So I don't know if somebody wrote that down where she would like a website or a bus stop, but I'm happy to talk to that, John Austin. Where was that location again? What was the location? Riverside. Oh, Riverside. Riverside? Yeah, it's close to River Point. There's a River Point over there by Riverside. Okay. South for Irene Street. River Point Apartments? Okay, River Point Apartments. Okay. Do we'll you have an address? 501 South Irene Street. It's on Irene Street. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Uh, all right. Who else has any comments? Let me come around this way. <clears throat> you should sit in a circle. We do that at church sometimes. Right. It might be better. It might be. Um, hello, I'm Dana, and um, I'm an advocate. I work with Disability Connections, and there's something I want to read. It's not too long, so, so don't worry. But um, just as consumers need accessibility in their home, they need it in their city. A disability is a natural part of life. We can be living with a disability or encounter one at any time. 
Accessibility is needed in our public buildings, parks, and recreation, as well as the ability to communicate in any format um, that we may need. We all benefit from universal accessibility, and we are all have the right through the Americans with Disabilities Act to have the inclusion and accommodations to live our lives in the community. And I think that one thing that we also have to think about whenever um, we're built we're uh, making things accessible is not just like the minimum in accessibility because the minimum minimum in accessibility does not always help all people because people have different disabilities um we need like you know wider doorways maybe um lighter doors for those people um in wheelchairs that have difficulty pushing you know the doors at these public buildings um, just to think about like different things to where the most people could get the most benefit from the accessibility in the city. Thank you. All right, who's next? Um, I have a, I just have, I have a couple of things to say. Um, I'm a person with a disability living here in San Angelo and I'm also an advocate. Um, and I also believe that um, disability is a natural part of the human experience. I think probably almost every single person in here has a disability of some kind. That might be nearsightedness, it might be that you have um, an amputation, you know, it can range anywhere from something very simplistic that you can use assistive technology to overcome to something more significant that requires some accessibility features um, available to you to enjoy some of the services. Um, in what we do at Disability Connections, I'm also part of Disability Connections, um, we believe in person-first language. And so I know that that is a cultural thing and probably not something that everyone is experiencing. Um, but there is a word that I, I keep hearing and so I wanted to, I wanted to help um, and educate you on the word handicap. Handicap is a very, um, derogatory statement. Um, it actually comes from the idea that individuals with disabilities are simply standing on the corner with their cap in hand, taking from society. And that is why we choose to say accessible. And that's why we choose to talk about individuals as a whole um, and address them in a person first language. Um, and so I just wanted to take that opportunity because I'm sure most people don't know that, you know. I didn't know that until I started working with Disability Connections, so um, I wanted to share that. And then I wanted to talk to the city, um, not just about recreation, um, because I actually, I used to be part of the recreation department, <laughs> and I actually think that the city recreation department does a really extraordinary job considering the barriers. Um, that are in front of them in implementing accessibility here in the city. And what I mean by that is, um, in my experience with the city, I think the most significant barrier to us achieving an accessible community, a truly accessible community, is the attitudinal barriers that stem from ableism. And um, ableism is not something that is often talked about, but that is really the idea that able-bodied individuals are the majority, so we create everything for able-bodied individuals. Even though most of us are at some point in our life not going to be as able-bodied as we are now, so it's really defeating, <laughs> you know, our whole existence whenever we do that. Um, but it's something that is deeply embedded and it is systemic, and I really think that that is the primary issue with the city of San Angelo and the accessibility issues. I think this is something that needs to be addressed internally because I see these efforts um, and while I wanna say thank you for these efforts, I'm, I can't avoid the fact that this is 30 years ago. So even with the best of intentions, if that system and that belief is still in place, you are not ever going to truly achieve an accessible community for everyone. And I know that takes a deep dive into looking at yourselves. Um, it takes a deep dive into all of us. Um, the community 
along with the city because individuals that are able-bodied, you know, we tend to be pretty entitled. We tend to be pretty, you know, take it for granted. <laughs> I remember when I didn't have to wear contacts to drive my car. <laughs> you know, I can't imagine. I wouldn't be able to drive my... I was thinking about that on the way here. I would not have been able to drive to get here in the time frame that I needed to if I didn't have contacts. And that seems... We don't even think about it because that's an accepted accommodation. That's an accepted piece of assistive technology. And it makes sense to a great deal of people. Um, the things that need to change is the way that we think whenever we begin thinking and we begin planning these projects. That needs to put disability as a priority because all that does is increase the usability. It increases the access. It increases the safety. It complements our city and what we want to be as an accessible community. When I worked for the city, I worked for um, the Senior Services Division and Recreation Division. And everyone that I dealt with had some sort of significant disability. And they're the, they were the majority of the population here in San Angelo. And I don't know if they still are or not, but they were at that time. And then to think that our city was struggling with accessibility then, and we, I don't feel like we've made that much headway. I know recently we have. I, I will take that back. Because I have witnessed some significant changes. Um, with curb cuts downtown and some of the um, additions of ramps and, and, that, and those sorts of things. But just like everyone else here is saying, you, the minimum standards will not create accessibility. The, the ADA standards are rules and laws to keep you from getting in trouble. They even say in the, in the um, ADA, it even says, these are not the suggested and recommended you know, systems. This is the bare minimum that you can do. So when we look at this as a compliance issue only, we will never, we will never be accessible. We won't. And um, I want to believe and I want to trust that this is really, really the best intentions that this city has. But in my experience, I have received lip service. Our consumers have received lip service. And you have to accept that you have really, really eroded and undermined the trust of the disability community. And then when you expect the disability community to show up and talk to you, I think, I think the ball's in your court now. I think that you need to do a better job of promoting the things that you have. I worked for the city and I'm sitting here learning about things that I didn't know. You have to be proactive. You have to say, this is what you get when you come to San Angelo because it is accessible. Our, our programs are accessible. Our streets are accessible. You can go anywhere in San Angelo and enjoy yourself. You have to make the effort to promote that. I know that the attendance today is primarily a result of the um, San Angelo Advocacy for Access group. Um, because I wouldn't even have known about it. I think that's on the city as well. And um, so I, I went completely off script here, but I think I basically said what I wanted to say. Um, the city needs to do a, an internal self-check, and there needs to be some leaders rise up and say, okay, no more eye rolling, no more looking at this like a burden. Let's sit down and let's look at this like an opportunity Let's engage people with disabilities. Stop making excuses. If we're going to head in the right direction, we're going to have to do that. And that's going to take a very strong leader. Because I, I worked for the city. I know how it works. So and that, that's all. Yeah. Um, as I'm taking the mic over there, I want to make one comment. I agree with a lot of what you said about us taking personal accountability for that. And we're taking a lot of heat from some folks right now because we're doing this self-assessment in-house. And we're accused that it's only because we're saving money. And yes, it's going to save us a great deal of money to do this self-assessment in-house. But I want to do this self-assessment in-house. And I think Daniel wants to do this self-assessment in-house because we need to do the work. If we hire a consultant to come in here and do a self-assessment for us, they're going to get their questions answered. They're going to write a policy book and it's going to go on a shelf. And that is what I have learned, you know, working in cities for 20 years. If you want a city to change, you need to allow the people to change it. And that comes with, I understand there's a trust issue. 
Um, we are working on that. Daniel is working on that. I know Carl's working on that and Brian's working on that. And if anybody has any ideas or thoughts on how to get people to read our stuff and come to our meetings, I think every director in the city would appreciate that. But okay, let me give it. I do understand that. What I would say to that is, you're looking at the existing administration, and you have to be, I mean, seriously, you're saying we're capable and we know what to do whenever there's things that haven't been done. And that's just being honest with you. I mean, that has to be something you have to consider. You have to bring in people with disabilities. You do not know what it's like to use a wheelchair unless you're using one. You don't know what it's like to, to have to schedule an interpreter unless you have to schedule an interpreter. I cannot speak for the entire disability community. I can make my best dis ditch efforts to make this an accessible meeting, but if I don't include those people, it won't be. So, Which is a great plug for our ADA Accessibility Committee. If you're interested in being part of that, please let us know. Um, you can email me. We have a sign-up sheet at the back. Um, we don't want to force anybody to sign in. You know, a lot of meetings you have to sign in to come into the meeting. If you feel comfortable signing in and you put contact information back there and put an X by your name, I'll know you want to be part of that committee. But we are forming that committee to get that input. So people who are interested, please consider signing up. Okay. My name is Janie Kiker. I'm an advocate as well. And um, the questions that I have are just like on this committee, um, are you going to make sure that there's a range of different people that are allowed? I mean, because there's a lot of adults here, um, but the youth have a great presence um, in our communities. And they get a lot of attention through the schools and whatnot, but those people grow up. <laughs> and those people have parents. And um, it's really, there's nothing like going to an event or whatnot and struggling. And you know what it's like whenever you have small children. Well, whenever you have other people, other wide range of things, uh, there's there's so many different things that you, you run into. So I just want to encourage that you go from uh, addressing parents to uh, addressing the whole range and not looking at just volunteers because we encourage people to participate and get involved and whatnot. But COVID um, had people call, crawl in their, in their caves. And before COVID, they had some accessibility issues. And so those things kind of topple up and so you really gotta you gotta get their attention at times so they can go and and be involved and and um people can take note and see because people with disabilities ab the ability is the part that we should really um focus on everybody's abilities because people have so much to give you see different people that have all the accessibility that they need and they are very successful and I want that for our community too, because out of sight, out of mind, but in sight, you have everybody that wants to participate, everybody that wants to be involved. And I know that our agency um, encourages us all to be peers. And so we're all on the same level playing field. So I just thought, want that for my fellow person as well. Yeah, I appreciate that comment. And I used to sit in y'all's chairs as an advocate for people with disabilities and go to meetings and say, why are there not more people with disabilities here? And now that I sit on the city side as the entity that you guys are coming to and asking, and the answer is we can't find people to volunteer. We really, I mean, that's clear across the board. We can't find board members. We can't find coaches for our rec leagues. We really need your assistance in helping us identify citizens of San Angelo who would be good to serve on this committee. So yes, I we will try to get as broad a group as possible, but anything you guys can do to help us, we're going to push it on social media, I'm sure. Um, again, email me, call me, whatever you need to do, but we really do need help finding people. Just an extension of that, um, at what percentage of, of weight will they get to have input uh, towards these changes, and will the public be able to be um, uh, like have a summary or something of that nature that would uh, give us some ease that they're getting their voice heard? Um, generally, the way the city works is that when the mayor creates a committee or we create a board, 
um, of citizens, they make a recommendation to council at a council meeting. And so people really need to be tuned into the council meetings. I mean, I love council meetings. That is where, I mean, not every day, but I love them mostly because that is where all the efforts of my staff and myself come to play. That's where all these directors, their stuff comes to play. So any recommendations that come from any committee go to council and is talked about at a public meeting. So participating in those meetings, watching those meetings, you know, we do stream online, putting comments in those um, online streamings, we do read those. Um, that is part of the way that you can help communicate with us and know that you're being heard. Um, I think in order to build trust, um, it would be a really good idea, and I said this before in our last meeting last month with the directors, that you hire an outside ADA advocate, um, a, a cons consultant who that's their forte and that they come and do the self-assessment for the city. I think that it's a missed opportunity. I understand the cost. It's an investment in the people that are in this room and that are in the um, community. Um, it's, it's a missed opportunity to better our city. I know that your intentions are good, that you want you know your directors to learn things on, on the web <laughs> and to do their self-assessment, but really an outside person looking in is really the best way to go on that. Also, and I, this isn't personal, Teresa, but if you were such a good advocate or such a strong advocate, why did it take Kim and I to bring these points up in city council? If you've been here for a few years as city attorney, you should have brought it up sooner and, and in council or, or made the efforts that we did. So I, and it's not personal, it's just that's how we see it and, or how I see it. And I think that that's where that trust issue is. Um, that's why I urge you guys to get an ADA coordinator as soon as possible. I mean, I can completely understand that comment. And the answer is, is that this is a big city and there's a lot to look at. And until somebody starts bringing us, we did. I know y'all don't believe it, but we did start talking about this in 2018. And then COVID happened and all eyes went to COVID for years. So really it's that we don't have people complaining. In my seven years here, almost eight years, we've had two complaints about ADA issues. So when we meet with people and we say, give us your complaints, you don't have to give us your name. We just need to know what it is we're doing or not doing that you want to do differently. We mean that and we really need that information because I'm not interacting with the city in the same way that all of our citizens are. I'm not in a wheelchair until my mom comes to visit, which is not as often because she is um, disabled. I don't even really relate. When I had kids in strollers, I was all about it because you push a kid in a stroller, you get some conception of what it's like to be in a wheelchair. But that's really the answer. I mean, I think it's a two-way street that we need to reach out more, but we also really need people to reach out to us. And I know it's an effort and trust, but we really are seeking that input. Teresa, so I want to add that uh, the city <laughs> faces major challenges uh, every day. Um, from water, you know, to infrastructure, to uh, public safety, to drainage, there's a lot of issues that the city addresses, not just for, for ADA accessibility, but for all the citizens. Uh, and, and quite frankly, we're doing our absolute best to make sure that we address those major issues. Um, you coming to us and talking to us more about the ADA concerns, uh, you have our ears. We want to make sure that we're addressing that as well. Uh, you know, everything that we do as far as grants that we receive, uh, everything has to be done uh, with AD accessibility, so we've been mindful of that. And sometimes we think that we're taking care of that, uh, that we're, we're doing our part on, the, on, that, on that phase of it, because we're so concentrated on the major, major concerns that we're addressing for the community. But again, I can tell you right now, we don't want an adversarial relationship with any of y'all. Uh, did we do things perfectly in the past? No, we didn't. But we are here to tell you that we're putting our best effort moving forward to uh, really address these concerns that you have at this point. And we want you to be able to feel comfortable coming to us and letting us know, hey, these are the areas that we want you to look at. And I'm telling you right now, it's not going to fall on deaf ears. This is not a meeting just to appease you or the ADA accessibility, uh, the community. We want to make sure that everybody understands that we're here for a purpose. Uh, we don't want to waste your time. We don't want to waste our time. We want to make sure that we're doing everything we possibly can to address our issues. 
Well, see, we have about five minutes left, but before I let you do your comment, we are going to continue to watch the email and we will continue to watch the comments on this video. So if anybody doesn't have an opportunity to make their comment tonight, you can still do that through either one of those means. You can also call me, email me, fill out one of our forms online. All of those are ways that you can get your opinions heard. Um, my name is Lori DeSello and I am, I guess, a volunteer for the city because I have sat on two advisory boards because I wanted to do something or make a difference. So please, if you can provide any kind of input, I don't have much input that I could do for ADA, but I love my parks. Um, I am now in the civics board because my time ended. And I have met several people that I see sitting here. So just because I've met them, I'm able to go to them and bring my problems. And it really helps when you put forth that kind of effort. And I hope that the city appreciates my effort. So. OK, anybody else want to make a comment? Hey, Teresa. Yes. So I will mention we did get a, uh, a comment online asking about where can we find the budget outlining funds for improvements of accessibility. Um, I responded to them, but I, I wanted to share this with everyone that you can view all of our budgets at cosatx.us slash budget. Um, if you have any questions about the budget, you can comment on any of these. You can email us. You can call us, and we can get you in touch with our, our budget staff, and they'd be happy to, to explain anything to you. I'd also like to add to that that, you know, as we said at the very beginning, as we do new projects, and part of the reason you don't see faster improvements is this city has gone a long time without doing major street projects, without doing, I mean, it's 87 since the river stage. So that's part of the reason we're behind. We just don't improve facilities very often. Um, but you're going to see a, you're going to see a project budget. It's not necessarily going to indicate ADA improvements. I'll tell you as a matter of law, up to 20% of those of our, the project can be for ADA cost. After that, we can say it's too expensive. But um, I actually had a conversation with Tina this morning about perhaps including a new budget code that specifically addresses those ADA components that we're installing so people can go to the budget and look and see, well, how much is the city spending on ADA accessibility issues? Any other comments? I have one thing to say. Um, my husband is handicapped. I really never thought much about handicap accessibility until I became the wife of a double amputee. Y'all have a lot of accessibility, but there's not advertisement for it. My son was in the choir um, at his junior high, and we went to take him to Murphy Hall to the choir. I couldn't get my husband in the building until I went into the building to find out how to get out of the building in a wheelchair so that I could go back to the car and get him to then take him back to where now the concert's going and he can't get in. But he could have gotten in had somebody been there to say, you have to be on the other side of the building. If there had been a map, if there had been anything to say, this is where you go when you're in a wheelchair. Because you go up there and there is stairs you know, there's the rocky stairs uh, to get in that building and nothing to talk about where wheelchairs go. You know, and I'm guessing there's probably more buildings like that than anybody cares to mention. But for my junior high son to not have his dad at a concert was crushing. Um, for my son who's not handicapped, when it was possible, but we didn't know. Yeah, I will say we've had that concern before that people don't know how to get into the Murphy. And when you do get in there, that is a long, straight ramp to go down to those seats at the beginning. Um, we have improved that somewhat. There are signs sitting right inside the door of that accessible entrance that whenever they have an event. Yeah, we're doing we're working on the signage to make sure everybody knows that. I hear what you're saying, and we are we have been aware of that, and we are making steps to correct that. All right, I want to thank, like, do you have something else to say, Daniel? No, I'm, I'm fine. Yeah, I want to, okay. Go ahead. Oh. Okay, all right. So um, I just wanted to ask, you know, before I was on the, um, I was on the, uh, for the state of Texas, the governing board, you know, for the um, people with disabilities. But so I'm just curious, there is money that's 
like federally allocated for people with disabilities. And I know it goes to different departments, um, you know, but it's specifically for like ADA accommodations, people with disabilities. And I know that money has to be used for those specific things. So I just want to make sure I'm understanding that right. Is, is, that, is that correct? The monies, as far as what's available, as, as a matter of fact, some of the projects that we work on, Chevron Street projects, uh, for example, um, when we do apply for, for certain grants, there's that accessibility uh, requirement, and we want to make sure that in order for us to secure certain grants and certain monies, we have to make sure that we address accessibility. So, yes, sir, uh, that's something that we take a look at. We do take a look at the grants that are available for our community and the requirements for those for those grants. And, uh, of course, if there's those pretty much everything that you're going to get that you're going to build is going to require ADA accessibility. So uh, we do address it in that manner. I want to thank you. I want to thank our interpreters who came to our meeting. This is not a common occurrence for us. Um, I do know that one thing we've talked about internally is whenever we have a declared emergency that we're sure to have somebody who's signing at those events um, for sure and hopefully when we get picture in picture that'll happen. Again, if you have any comments, info at cosatx.com. You can email me. Dot US. At the back. Oh, dot US. <laughs> info at cosatx.us. Um, if you want to look and fill out the forms, that is cosatx.us backslash ADA. And then my phone number and email is on the screen. Please feel free to call me anytime. All right, thank you all for coming. Thank all of you all. Absolutely.